All right. Now, in Jeremiah chapter number 18, um, great passage of the Bible here, but basically, okay, the title of my sermon this morning is called The Salvation of a Nation. And there's some very important concepts that we need to understand just in reading the Bible and understanding doctrine and things like that. Um, the first one is that when the Bible, when the word salvation or even just the concept of salvation or being saved is mentioned in the Bible, it's not always referring to your soul. And this is where a lot of false doctrine comes from. People use scripture and twist scripture to prove a workspace salvation and to prove that you have to give up your sins. You have to do all of these things in order to be saved. It's because they're not understanding the context of how words are used and not understanding that, that words can have multiple meanings. I mean, it's not like they're necessarily vastly different from one another, but the context determines the meaning of what we're talking about. So just because you see the word saved, people turn to each other and say, oh, we'll see the word saved right there, so you got to do this and that. It's not always talking about your soul. It's not always talking about your eternal salvation. And we see here, look down at verse number... Um, We'll start reading again in verse number 7. It says, At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what, na what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, that I obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. And see, these are the types of passages that someone will turn to to say, you have to repent of all of your sins in order to be saved. Because, you know, if you do good, if you, you know, if you start doing good, then God's going to save you. If you do bad, then he's not going to. And, you know, this may not be a top verse that people will use, but I'm going to this passage specifically because it's very, very clear. He says in verse 7, it says, I shall speak concerning a nation. He's talking about a nation, a group of people. He's not talking about the individual. So when it says, look, if there's a nation that's doing wickedly, if there's a nation that is committing wicked acts, doing abominable sins, whatever it may be, if they hear and if they repent and if they stop doing that wickedness, if they get their hearts right with God as a whole, as a nation, obviously he's not talking about 100% of the people, every single person that exists in that nation. No, he's talking about the nation as a whole. And Oftentimes, you'll see that that's tied in with the leaders. When you go through the, the books of the Chronicles and the kings, and you see the kings of Judah and Israel, you know, whether a nation does good or evil is kind of, a lot of that ha is tied in with, with the king, with the ruler of that, of that people. And again, does one dictate the other? I don't know. I mean, typically, I think we end up getting more wicked rulers because the people in general are more wicked, more so than a wicked ruler is making the people do wickedness. I think it's just the, the ruler is indicative of the people in general. Um, I know it's not always necessarily the case with a king where it's just inherited down a line. You know, you can't say that 100% for sure, but at least in our nation, you know, the more wicked our nation becomes, the more wicked our rulers become because it's just a reflection on our society. But God doesn't change. God deals with nations the same way. And this is a wake-up call for America this morning. Because America as a nation is involved in a lot of wickedness and a lot of open embracing of sin. Open embracing of the, of the sodomites, of the queers, of, of, of everything. It's not even just them. I mean, that is like the worst. When you're open, openly embracing something completely perverted and wicked as that, it's like, what have we become? You know, it, it's one thing to, to embrace the adultery, which again, that is also extremely wicked and, ex, and, and extremely perverted to just be saying, hey, you know, there's nothing wrong with this. And, and, and people are going through wives and husbands and they're just getting divorced because they're out fornicating and they're out committing adultery and doing all these different things. And it's, it's displayed in Hollywood, it's displayed on the TVs and it's on the movies and people just kind of rejoice in it or just, just say, oh, it's not that big of a deal. And, and, and the, the nation as a whole just continues to get involved in this type of a sin. And, and, 
as a whole, this is what we're putting out. I mean, America is, is spewing the filth of Hollywood. The Hollywood movies are coming out of here, out of our nation. This is what's being promoted to the entire world. And it's wickedness and it's sin. And God is going to judge this nation for all the wickedness that goes on. I mean, you think about the, the murders that are going on, the innocent blood being shed on a daily basis through the hands of doctors, and they call it an abortion. They give it a different term. They say, oh, no, 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 it's not murder, it's a fetus. No, it's a human being. That's a little child. It's a life that you are just extinguishing and they literally have blood on their hands from the operations that they're doing, from the murdering that they're doing. God sees that. God sees all of those little souls being destroyed and this nation embracing it. And even saying, you know what? It's legal. There's nothing against the law with murdering an innocent child that can't defend themselves. In the womb, completely dependent. It's legal. We're going to embrace that. That is a wicked society. And you can see how, how far down we've gone just in a short period of time. I'm only 37 years old. And in my short lifetime, growing up from a child, I have seen such a drastic... And, and look, I wasn't saved young or anything. I grew up in a, in a normal, average home. And, and even the average, you know, worldly home or whatever, the, the standards have dropped so low and the filth has gotten so bad. And we have to understand that as a nation, in order to, and, and I don't even think at this point, I think we've just gone too far. I think God's judgment is going to come no matter what. But if you remember in the days of Josiah, See, prior to Josiah as a king of Israel, there was Manasseh, and Manasseh did wickedness in the sight of God. Hezekiah had broken down all the altars of Baal. Hezekiah had done all this great stuff and gotten the, the people on track and gotten people serving the Lord. And then Manasseh comes into power and he destroys everything that Hezekiah had done. He rears up the altars to Baal, the false gods, the Satan worship starts again, but he makes it way worse. And, 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 and really gets that nation into a wicked state. Then by the time Josiah comes around, he's got a heart to serve God. And, he get, and he, you know, he's repentant and he says, man, you know, we've done wickedly. We want to get right with God. He sees all this stuff in the Bible and saying, what have we done? You know, this is, we're, we're, we're in bad times here because the Lord has said this. And they go to seek God and God tells them, you know, because you've humbled yourself, because you're following me, he says that the judgment's basically not going to come in your days, but it's still coming because what Manasseh did is just too much. So even though they got back on track, which is the right thing to do no matter what, that judgment is still coming. I think that's a point that we're at today. And the only hope that we can have is just to say, you know what, if we can get this country turned around now, um, then at least maybe we can stay that judgment from coming in our lifetime. And maybe if, you know, if, if the if that were to happen, God could end up showing some mercy. He always ends up showing mercy when people are truly repentant and they, and they have this heart of, of change and they, and they want to do what's right. So even if you're experiencing then that judgment coming down when you're doing right, hey, continue to do right. If the people were con would continue to do right, we can lessen that impact of that judgment that's going to come. But that's, see, this is the way a nation is saved. It's from stopping to do the wickedness. It's from changing your works, changing your actions to doing good things instead of doing evil things. That is not how a person's soul is saved. Obviously, everyone here knows that, but that our soul is saved simply through the blood of Jesus Christ by putting faith on what he did. That is the only thing that could save our soul from going to hell. That is why um, you know, there's so many people that don't understand. It's a real basic concept, though. That, that there's, there's, when the Bible talks about salvation or being saved, you have to get the context. You have to read the whole chapter or the whole book or whatever and, and get what, is he, what are we talking about here. Instead of just ripping one verse out and saying, see, look, if you do evil, then you know, you're not saved. If you do good, then you are saved. No, look, that's not how it works with our souls. You can't apply everything to the soul. Um, an example of this, you don't have to turn there, but Psalm 116, verse 13 the Bible says, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. 
Okay, well, that's fair enough to say that's talking about your soul, talking about your soul's salvation. How many times in the New Testament we see that, you know, salvation is just as easy as taking a drink of water? Um, Jesus even talked to the woman at the well and basically gave the same type of example. So I take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And in context, again, when you're looking at that, it's talking about the soul. There's many places that you, could, you can prove that from. However, in, in Exodus chapter 14, verse 13, the Bible says, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. This is when the children of Israel were fleeing from Egypt, and they got to the point where they're at the Red Sea, and then there's nowhere for them to go and Pharaoh's armies are chasing after behind them. And Moses is saying, look, don't fear. Today you are going to see God's salvation. He wasn't talking about them going to heaven. He wasn't talking about seeing God's salvation. He said, hey, you're all going to be saved today because you've left Egypt. Like your souls. You know, that's not what he's talking about. He's going to see his salvation because Moses was going to part that Red Sea and they're all going to cross on dry land and God was going to save them from the physical danger of being killed by the Egyptians. That's the salvation the Bible is talking about there. So anytime, you, you, we have to be really careful about this because it's easy to get in conversations and people are, are kind of mixed up on this doctrine or believing in work salvation. When they come at you with verses, anytime you're dealing, and this, this goes, I don't care what you're talking about, whether it's this or anything. When someone brings up a verse, well, the Bible says this, Always, always, always get in the habit of saying, well, let's turn there. Let's turn there. Let's turn there. Because that's how people are deceptive and able to get you on their train of thought and their way of thinking. When they just say, here's this verse and here's this verse and here's this verse. And they draw a conclusion. You say, wait, 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 wait. Let's read all those in context to make sure that you're applying this the way that it ought to be applied. And we need to be careful with our own studies, with our own beliefs, like that we're not just coming up and making up our own doctrines. Whether we're hearing it from someone else or whether we're just, just have a certain belief and we want to prove it. You know, don't go to the Bible to prove your own preconceived idea. Get your ideas and your beliefs from the Bible. You got, you got, you got it backwards if you're trying to just say, well, I think this way, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go try to prove that from the Bible. I mean, you can study out if you have a thought. There's nothing wrong with that. Saying, okay, I have a certain belief and I'm going to check it out in the Bible. Then honestly look and see does it, does it match up. But don't go just trying to prove something that you believe just because you believe it and trying to make the Bible say something doesn't. Check the context. Read the chapters. Understand what it's saying. And this, again, this is a passage here in chapter 18 of Jeremiah. It's a, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty popular passage talking about the potter right? And the, and the clay. And we have a wicked church in town here. It's called the Potter's House. I think there's a few of them, but there's one in town here. And they're a charismatic Pentecostal church. And they literally teach you that, you know, when you get saved, you have to live righteously. And if you don't, you can lose that salvation. Because, and, and, they, and they use this scripture as, and they pervert it of saying, well, see, you know, if you're saved, God's going to mold you and fashion you. And you know, you will be living a different life no matter what. And just, they kind of put that works in there uh, as part of your salvation. And they add that to the salvation when it's not a part of it at all. And um, <clears throat> obviously in this context, God's talking about the nation of Israel. He's talking about the nation of them being... Um, He says in verse 6, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? So the, the example he just gave of the potter, he was applying it to the nation of Israel. He's not applying it necessarily to the individual. Now, there are some applications you may be able to take, um, but it has to line up with the rest of Scripture. As soon as you start um, saying things that are contradictory, to, for example, to your salvation, to the salvation of your soul, saying, oh no, you have to have these works, it's not true anymore because then you're going to be contradicting other parts of Scripture. But um, just understanding that concept is huge. And, that, and that's one of the main points of the sermon. So if you walk away with nothing else, make sure that everything you are getting is in context. 
and and when you read something with salvation or whatever it may be, because there's there's lots of different there's lots of different meanings for words in, in some cases, and salvation is a perfect example of that. Go ahead and turn to Jonah chapter three because we're gonna see another example of um, of a nation and a nation being saved. And because these, th there's these different types of salvation, that's why people get confused and they try to apply it to your soul. Jonah chapter 3, remember Jonah was sent to the city of Nineveh. To the nation of Nineveh. He was, he was, he was sent to Nineveh to preach against them because they were doing wickedly. They were, they were committing evil acts. They were doing wicked things. So God decides to send them a prophet. Now the reason why God is sending prophets to wicked nations is so that they can change, so that they can repent, so that they can hear and they have the opportunity to change. I mean, that's, that's the whole point, right? And, you, know, you, you know the story. Jonah didn't really want to do it. So he walks, so he, he's kind of going the other direction and, and he goes through his own turmoil for that and getting swallowed up by the whale, spending three days and three nights in the whale's belly. And, um, and God finally gets his attention. So then he says, okay. Now he, he kind of sees things God's way after, after that little bit of, uh, of, of trouble. But we see here in chapter 3, we're going to start reading in verse number 4. The Bible says, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. So it was a really big city. It says he began to enter the city a day's journey. So, so walking into the city for a whole day. Like he's just getting into this city. And, um, and he cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So this is a very unpopular message. Hard preaching saying, Look, God's going to destroy this city in 40 days. He's going he's gonna to come and he's going to wipe you out. He says, 40 days, God's going to come and bring judgment upon this nation or upon this city. Verse 5 says, So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. And that verse 10 is a great verse there showing and proving that, that when, a, when a person turns from their wicked way, when a person you know, changes their lifestyle and changes you know, from doing wicked things to doing good things, doing righteous things, those are works. Those are good works. But the Bible says in Ephesians 2, it says, you know, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we have one verse that says being saved is not of works. And yet we have another passage over here that says they were saved by their works. Either there's a contradiction or that word saved is meaning two different things within the context. And that's what we're talking about this morning is that just because you see that word saved, it doesn't mean that it's always talking about the soul. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, yes, that's talking about the soul. Our soul salvation has nothing to do with our good deeds, has nothing to do with our good works, has nothing to do with living a good life and getting sin out of our life and doing all that other stuff. Hey, look, those are good things that we ought to do those so we could be spared physically so that God's judgment doesn't come upon the nation or upon the city or the place where we live as a people, as a group of people, look, we need to repent of all of that wickedness and do good works so that God's judgment doesn't come upon us physically, but he's not talking about our souls. 
Very important to understand that. We're talking about the salvation of a nation. The salvation of a nation is based on its works. And we see they had the proper response in Nineveh. And what happened? God spared them. God did. He, he, he was merciful unto them and said, okay, since you've humbled yourself, I mean, they, fa they were serious about it. They fasted. They, they put off their good clothing. They, they sat in sackcloth and ashes. They were, they were mourning. They were fasting. And, they, and the king is saying, look, you know, stop from the evil way. Stop from the violence that's in your hands. Stop doing all this wickedness and all this wrong. We need to get right with God so that we could just survive so he doesn't destroy our whole city. And would to God America could just wake up and, and see the wickedness and the, and, the, and the utter sin and filth and depravity that we're in today in 2014 and just say, we've got to get right with God. These words are real. God is a real God. He is a God of judgment. And our nation is going to go down the tubes really fast unless we do something and change. And change the way we think. Change the way we act. Get rid of all this garbage. Get rid of all the Hollywood. Don't let this stuff get into your mind and, and brainwash you into thinking that sin is okay. We need to get our minds back into this book. And I know in a digital age today, it's hard to pick up a book. But I recommend, look, we need to pick up this book. Get rid, you know, put the devices down for a minute and get into God's word and, and stop allowing all these things to get into your mind and, and, and change the way you think about sin and, and change the way that you don't even understand the way God thinks about sin. Let's go ahead and turn to, um, I'll turn if you would to Matthew 24. Because we're going to see here an example of, of a place. And there's a few places we're going to turn to this morning before we're finished that, that, People get screwed up with, with their soul salvation doctrine because of what it says in a few verses here and there. So we're going to look at this in Matthew chapter 24. I've heard people use this verse out soul winning to apply it to their soul. To, to say that this is why they're saved. If you're in Matthew 24, look at verse number 13. The Bible says, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And, and I mean, who's heard that before? Who's, who's heard people say, well, you've got to endure unto the end or else you're not saved. And what they mean by that is like, well, if you end up getting out of church, if you end up backside, if you end up getting in all this sin, then you weren't really saved because you didn't endure unto the end. And they'll take a passage like this. And you see, when someone just throws a verse out like this, and then they'll throw out another one and throw out another one, you can start to think, oh man, maybe they're right. Oh man, what, is the, you know, what does the Bible say? They're throwing out these verses. Well, that's what the Bible says. Not in context. This is not talking about your soul at all. Let's see, let's see what is the context of Matthew 24. Jump up to verse number 3 because... You know, all of this, mo the majority of Matthew 24 we're reading there is Jesus Christ speaking to his disciples. So let's see, why is he even talking to them? What, what, what prompted this discussion? What prompted them to tell them that he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved? Look at verse number three says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So, to start off, the context of this whole um, speech, this whole preaching of Jesus Christ to the point that we're at right here in Matthew 24, they were asking about the end of the world, right? They're saying, hey, what, what are going to be the signs? What's going to happen at the end of the world? When you come back, what's it going to be like? That's what they want to know. And he starts off just telling them, hey, look, take heed that no man deceive you. Now, I'm going to tell you. So he starts telling them all this stuff. And in the, the context of the passage, this verse comes up that says, He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. But here's the clincher. If you keep reading, look at verse number 22. He explains without a shadow of a doubt what he is talking about, about endure, he that endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Verse 22 says, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So he's talking about the end times. He's talking about a great tribulation. He's talking about hard times that people are going to be going through. There's going to be people, you know, false Christ arising. There's going to be people coming against you. You know, the Antichrist is going to come into power. And there's all these things are going to happen. But if you endure unto the end, you're going to be saved. And what does he mean by saved? Your flesh. 
When the Antichrist comes into power and he starts lining up and killing the Christians and saying, hey, you can't buy or sell, and if you don't worship the beast, we're going to put you to death. If you don't take this mark, we're going to put you to death. If you could endure until the time of Jesus' return, your flesh is going to be saved. Amen. That's what he's talking about. In context, you could read that and see that is clearly what this passage is teaching. He even says that there should no flesh be saved. He's talking about your body, your flesh, not your soul. Now, nowhere in this context is it ever talking about your soul being saved for, you know, for any reason in, in any way. Um, that's not what this chapter is dealing with. It's dealing with end times prophecy. So again, you know, when people come to you and, and, and bring this stuff up, it's, it's a total misunderstanding and it's usually just the result of some false prophet just teaching lies on this congregation and the congregation not doing the work for themselves. And if you're here this morning, look, do the work for yourself. Don't trust any man. I don't care who it is. The past, don't trust any man without seeing it for yourself in the scripture. Anything that you hear. Look, I'm not saying don't go to church and don't listen to a man. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. We are all responsible for the things that we believe. For what you believe personally, you believe in a false doctrine, hey, that's end up going to be on you. Now, if I cause you to go into false doctrine, God's also going to hold me accountable, but it's not going to absolve you from doing your own homework and reading the Bible for yourself. We all have to dig in and know the Bible for yourself. This is how you're not going to be deceived. Read it, get it in context, read it over and over again. So then when someone says, oh yeah, well, in Matthew 24, it says, he is, shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. You could say, it's not talking about your, your, your soul salvation. Matthew 24, wait, that's talking, about, that's talking about the end times. That's talking about people's bodies being saved. You're not going to be deceived by that. But you have to know the Bible for yourself. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 13. We're going to see another example that people like to use and to twist and to take out of context and talking about our soul's salvation when it's not talking about that. Luke chapter 13. All of these things are examples that I've heard people use as examples, specifically. I mean, these are not things that I'm just making up and saying, oh, some people say it. No, like literally, like, I've had people use these passages to try to prove a works-based salvation. And it's out there. I mean, people believe this and they just get, they get screwed up and think that every time a certain word is used, or, or people, it's the same thing with repent. Every time the word repent is used, people have this false belief to think that it just means, oh, to turn from your sins, turn from your sins. That's what repent means, turn from your sins. No. Sometimes it might mean that. Again, it's dictated by the context because the word repent by itself just means to turn um, or to change. You know, it's, it's, it's a change of mind. It's a turning. But, but what you're turning from and all that stuff is, is dictated by the context of the passage itself. Um, but that's a very common misunderstanding that people have because it's taught, because it's taught from the pulpit. But we need to understand this stuff for ourselves. Luke 13, if you're there, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So here we're seeing you know, some kind of persecution that comes against these Galileans that Pilate had, had mingled their blood with their sacrifices that, you know, Pilate killed these Galileans. But look at Jesus' answer, verse 2. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. And this was, a, we're, going, we're kind of going through this in the book of John, but it's this false idea, this false concept that just because a person is going through hard times or is being persecuted or has bad things happening to them, people like to just always immediately attribute that to some sin that's going on in their life. Saying, oh, well, you have all this bad stuff going on because you just must be in some horrible sin, which is just like Job's friends did to him in the book of Job. Job was a righteous man. All these horrible things happened to him, you know, extremely horrible times, yet his friends are just blaming him. Saying, well, you just must have some sin and we don't know about. Fess up, Job. Come on, tell us about it. You've got some horrible sin. Otherwise, this stuff wouldn't be happening to you. And that's a false idea. It's a false concept that people, and, and it was very prevalent 
in these days for sure, and still today, but, but especially in these times, you could read it because you could get it in the context. We're reading through the book of John and we're seeing it over and over again. You could see here in the book of Luke, Jesus is rebuking him and saying, look, do you think that just because these things happened, just because these Galileans suffered that, that they were sinners above everybody? But look at what he says. Because this is, this is where the false part of what we're dealing with this morning comes in. Verse number three, he says, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell, this is another example, and slew them. Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Now, there's a key word in this, in, in this parable, it's in, or in this story in verse 3 and in verse 5, where he says, except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. So, is he talking about their soul perishing unless they repent by getting right with God and not being a sinner above everyone else? Or is he saying, except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish? Likewise means in the same manner. Right? So the Galileans, he's basically saying that they weren't sinners above us, but, but um, because they suffered such things, except you likewise, um, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. When you repent of your wickedness and do good, that will save your flesh from being in a disaster like this, or maybe being in where the, the Tower of Siloam fell. When you repent and do good, you're not going to perish as they perished in the same way that they did. And how did they perish? Well, this is only talking about them perishing physically. Nowhere does it say, oh, these people went to hell, or the people on whom the tower in Siloam fell, they died and went to hell. And unless you repent, you're going to likewise go to hell. That's not what this is saying at all. This is saying that they physically died. I mean, the people, in the Galileans, that Pilate mingled their blood with their sacrifices, they died. That's all we get from this story. He says, look, unless you repent, you're going to likewise perish. And, and, and it's the same thing with the Tower in Siloam. He said, look, unless you likewise, unless you repent, you're likewise, in the same way, you're going to perish. Let's keep reading verse number six, because this is tied in as well. He gives this parable. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Now, again, this parable of the fig tree is not talking about our eternal salvation just as the people perishing is not talking about your eternal salvation in, in the verses just prior to this. The salvations of one's soul has to do with whether the tree is good. So in this example here, it's a fig tree. They know what kind of tree it is. It's a fig tree. Now, a fig tree would be a good tree, right? Because it's going to bring forth what? It's going to bring forth figs. And the only way you can know what type of tree it is generally is going to be by, by what type of fruit it brings forth. And the Bible says that, um, turn if you would to Matthew 7, you could see this. We're almost done. Matthew chapter 7. See, this is talking about cutting down a tree that's not bringing forth fruit. It's not doing its job, right? We have, we have a couple of trees in the front yard. And unless you really, really know a lot about trees, you're not going to know what kind of trees those are unless you can see the fruit that's coming off of them. They're apple trees. And the reason why we have those trees is because, guess what? We like to eat apples. <laughs> and we want those trees to produce fruit for us so that we can eat that fruit and, and get nourishment and, and get that food. And if those trees were not going to produce fruit, we're going to get rid of them because they're going to be useless for us. We're not buy it. We, didn't, we didn't plant those trees to build a tree house in. Now, there may end up being a tree house in them, but that wasn't the purpose that we got those trees. We, we, they got them, we have them for a purpose. And this is what he's explaining in this parable here that you know, this fig tree, he planted it in a vineyard. That's what the vineyard's for, is for these trees to produce fruit. So you go and use them, you know, it makes sense, right? And he's saying, look, I bought this tree. It's a, you know, I planted this tree. It's not bringing forth any fruit. 
I'm going to get rid of it. And look in, in, you're in Matthew 7, look at verse 17. The Bible says, Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. The same way that you know that I have apple trees in the front yard when they're producing apples, well, that must be an apple tree because it's producing apples. That's what the Bible's talking about. By their fruits, you shall know them. The fruit of a church. Hey, if the church is going out and they're getting soul saved and you talk to these people and you question about their salvation and they're saying, no, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm saved. Hey, that's fruit that's coming as a result of that church. That's kind of, it's one way you could judge whether the church you're going to is a good church or not is, when they're going out soul winning, when they're witnessing to people and people are getting saved, if you were to actually talk to them, are they really saved? Do they believe? Do they, is their faith in Christ? Hey, that's a good fruit that's coming forth. You could say, yeah, you know what? This is, you know, this looks good. It's a good tree. There's good fruit being produced by this. But um, the reason why, then, this parable we saw in Luke 13 is not talking about your souls because the tree is already there. They're not trying to determine, is this an evil tree or is this a good tree? They already know it's a good tree. What he's saying is, it's just not producing any fruit. So this could be applied exactly like this with Christians. You could be saved. You could have the seed of God's word that was planted inside of you take root when you believed on it and you have that seed inside of you, and I just preached on this with the new man a couple weeks ago, that gives you your everlasting life. You are saved. You have eternal security. You, are, you, are, you have eternal life. It lasts forever. But if you as a Christian are not bringing forth fruit, you are not doing works. You're not doing good. You're not bringing forth anything. What good are you going to be to God? You know, as God as, as the, the, the vineyard, as the, the husbandman, as, a, you know, as the owner of the vineyard, he's saying, look, you're saved. Yeah, there's no, I mean, you're not going to lose that salvation for any reason. But you're in my vineyard. I want you to produce. I want you to go out and I want you to bring forth fruit. I want you to, I want you to do work for me. I want you to bring something forward. And if you're a Christian and you're, just, you're useless to God, what he's saying is you might just want to just take you away then. Like when, and, and I didn't have that in my notes, but when Paul said that I myself should be a castaway, he's not good for nothing. Just being castaway. He's not talking about losing his salvation. He's just talking about, hey, look, if I'm not doing anything for God, if I'm not being productive, he might just, just take me home. Say, what, what do I got you on the earth for? What do I got you down there for? You're not, you're not listening to me. You're not doing what I'm, what I'm asking you to do or telling you to do. You're not doing these things. You're, you become useless to me. I'm just going to, you need to just end, end your life right now. And everyone that's alive today, the reason why we're alive is because God's got a purpose, purpose for you. God's got a plan for you. God wants you to bring forth fruit. And, um, and yes, he's merciful and long-suffering. And even in that parable, he's saying, wait, wait, you know, before we get rid of it, let's dung it. Let's really, you know, try to do what we can to make it to, to produce fruit. Let's give all the opportunities we can. And then, okay, after that, after we've, we've invested all this time and work into it, if the tree still isn't going to produce anything, then we'll take it away. And God will do the same thing with us as Christians. And that's why, you know, we could read these parables. We could read, you know, about people perishing. We have to be able to discern when it's talking about physically and when it's talking about spiritually. It's not, this is not talking about our spiritual salvation. The last point I want to make, um, let's see where we're at. Yeah, I got time for this. Matthew 21. You're in Matthew already. Let's turn to chapter 21. This is very similar. It's not exactly talking about the salvation. I know we're talking about the salvation of a nation this morning and the salvation of, of, a, of a, you know, physically. But this is something along, along similar lines. 
and it's timely with the you know we got the release of the marching to Zion it's gonna be coming out soon at, that talks about the the Jews not being God's chosen people anymore and and all this other stuff but let's read Matthew 21 and you'll see where I'm going with this verse number 33 says here another parable there was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country and when the time of the fruit drew near he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the, fr the fruits of it and the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another again he sent other servants more than the first and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on the, his inheritance. And they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men. And will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And see, this parable, this has to do with a nation. This has to do, he gives this parable of, you know, the, the owner of the vineyard, and he's sending people and, and, and um, sending his servants, but... The people are wicked. They're doing. They're supposed to be doing the work for him. They're beating him up. They're stoning him. And then he sends his son, and they kill him. Obviously, he, and he explains this too, that he he brings this back to Jesus Christ. He brings it back to himself, saying, "Look, God is sending his prophets unto you, O nation of Israel. God has been." giving you all of these prophets and sending people and sending his servants and trying to get you to listen and preaching these messages and trying to tell you the truth from God and saying, look, judgment's coming. Look, get yourself right. That's why we read the books of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. They're heavy books. These are books of them before they go into captivity and Jeremiah is partially while they're in captivity. They're, they're, you know, they're, getting, they're, they're about to get judged for their wickedness and God's trying to warn them. He's sending them a warning, but they're not listening they're turning their ear they don't want to hear it they don't want to have anything to do with it so after a while it gets to the point of saying look okay well you know what i'm going to send my son i've sent all these servants but now i love them i'm going to send my son they'll listen to my son they'll listen to him and they kill him he said, let us seize on the inheritance. And that's exactly what happened. God sent his son. He sent Jesus Christ. Of, uh, uh, you couldn't ask for anything more. If you need someone to give you a wake-up call, someone to grab your attention and say, look, you need to get right with God. God's son came. And, we're, and again, we're seeing this in the book of John. How, how the people, they saw the miracle. I mean, the Son of God comes performing miracles, healing the sick, raising the dead, doing amazing things that you have no explanation for except He's from God. Amen. And He's still rejected. And they still kill Him. It's amazing. But because of this, because they did this, because they rejected His Son, that's why He says in verse 43, they're for because of all this because you've rejected the servants because you've rejected the prophets because you've rejected his son for this reason therefore say unto you the kingdom of god shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof he says okay i've dealt with you children of israel you were my elect you were my chosen you are the ones that i've chosen to reveal my word unto to reveal my nature unto to reveal all this stuff but he says you know what it's, I'm done. You've killed my son. I'm done with you. It's going to be given to another nation. And this isn't talking about individuals. This is talking about the kingdom of God being taken from a nation. And bring into a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. 
And, and it ties right in with that, with that example we just read about, about you know, the fruit, um, the, the fig tree not bringing forth fruit. Hey, look, and, 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 he, and he talks about that also about people being grafted in, you know, that, that the Jews, the natural um, olive tree, we're, you know, as Gentiles, we're grafted into that tree, but hey, we could be removed just as easily because his rules apply the same. He's not a respecter of persons. He doesn't care about your genealogy. For the nation bringing forth the fruits, he cares about him doing the work. Hey, look, if you're born of God, if you're born again, you believe God, you believe on Jesus Christ. Hey, if you're bringing forth the fruits, there you go. He's going he's gonna to use you. He's going to deal with you. He's going to use you to, 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 bring, you know, to, to preach the kingdom of God. But if you're not bringing forth the fruits, he's going to say, I'm going to find someone who is. And it's going to be taken from you. It's going to be given unto this nation. And that's exactly what's happened to the nation of Israel as we know it today. It's, all, it's been taken from them. And it's been bringing, it's, it's given to another nation. That there's someone who's actually bringing forth the fruits. And in America, we need to repent. We need to make sure that we're bringing forth those fruits as a nation because I believe that God has used America more than just about any other nation except for you know, the old nation of Israel maybe. To, to, to bring forth his word. And I mean, think about who's sending out all the missionaries. Who's the one doing all the work? At least, at least historically in the past couple hundred years, it's been America. America's been that lighthouse of truth and liberty and freedom from God's word and, and living in, in a righteous standards. Hey, until just very recently, that has been coming from this nation and God has been using this nation. But God is about to take that away from us yes. unless we repent. So going back to Jeremiah 18, you have to turn if you want to. I was going to read Jeremiah 18, 11 says, Now therefore go to speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return ye now everyone from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. This is the message for our nation today. We need to do this. Unfortunately, it seems like the, the response has been to this point, what verse 12 is, the same response that they had. And they said, there is no hope, but we will walk after our own devices and we will everyone do the imagination of his evil heart. This has been the answer of, of the culture and the society today is saying, no, we're going to do what we want to do. So how do you impact that? You individually, you're not the nation. Right? But we need to have an impact on this. We need to try. I mean, if you're going to, if we can't just sit here and complain about it and be like, oh man, our nation's so wicked and God's going to bring judgment and everything else. Hey, look, we need to be active and we need to be doing something. We need to be bringing forth that fruit. We need to be going out and reaching individuals. Because what is a nation? It's a group of individuals, it's an entire group, but it's all made up of individual people. There's individual people all out there, you know, living in wickedness, living in sin. We as individuals need to reach those individuals one at a time. We can't let ourselves get overwhelmed and say, oh man, our whole, you know, this whole nation is just going to hell in a handbasket. I don't want to have anything to do with it. No, we need to do what we can. And all you can do is what you can do anyway. I mean, you, you, you're not individually, no one's going to be able to save the whole nation. No one can do it. It's too big of a task and it's overwhelming. But you can do what you can do. You can focus on your area, your neighborhood, your community, your, your small group that you can, you can focus on. We've got Prescott Valley. We've got this small area. I've got my neighborhood. I've got neighbors. I've got people I could talk to and people I could influence. And you do too. And we all have different people, different groups of people that we come into contact with. And one of the ways you're going to do it is by, hey, making sure you're living a righteous life. Don't add to the wickedness of this world don't add to God's wrath by you going out and just living in sin and, and, and disobeying God's laws. Start with yourself and then reach, you know, reach other people and, and reach them. You don't have to just, just turn them away at every point and, just, and have an attitude saying that I'm better than you because I'm living so great and you're not living that great. You know, teach them, show them from the Bible, show them the error of their ways and, 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 and lovingly explain to them, look, you know, if they're not saved, you need to get saved. If you are saved, man, get right with God, get in church, get, you know, start doing what's good and impact people and, and you know, and, and 
that, that's what we need to do if there's any hope for, for our country at all, if there, if there is any hope. I like to think that there is, if, there, if there's any hope, because it's a, it's, it's a better outlook to have than just saying there's no hope. So it's one of the things that could just help keep you going and say, you know what, I think there is some kind of hope. And regardless, there's always hope for the individual soul. There's always hope. For, for, for somebody soul out there to go out and do the soul winning. And see, we've gotten too lazy and, and too relaxed and the churches have gotten too lazy and have changed what church is designed for and think, oh, we're just going to bring the people in so that we don't actually have to go out to them. No, false. That's not what the church is about. We're going to go out and there's a whole movement of people that are like-minded and believe the way that we do that are going out and doing this work. Let's try to make it spread. Do what you can do. Use the tools you have at your expense. Use the internet. Use, you know, use the, the people you come into contact. Whatever it is that you have that you can use. Use those talents and use those abilities to further spread the good news and be a light in a, in a wicked world, in a world of darkness. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your word. I pray that you would please just stir up our spirits this morning. God, help us not to be overwhelmed with, with such a daunting task. God, help us just to stay focused every day of our life. Dear Lord, help us to whittle away and just do the things that we can do. Lord, help, but, but, but make sure, help us to have that priority in our hearts and our spirits that we're stirred up and say, you know what, this is really important. If I could reach just one more person, if I could knock one more door, if I could, if I could talk to one more relative, coworker, whoever it is, and just try to get through to them, dear Lord, help us to have that type of an attitude so that as a whole, as a nation, um, you know, by some miracle, by the grace of God, we can, we can get this country to repent and get back following the old ways and the old paths and, and not forget where we came from as a country, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just strengthen us, help us to do that. Lord, lead us to the people who are also going to help in this endeavor, dear God. You know who they are out there that just need to hear the right things. Help us to, to stir them up. Help us to live a righteous life that we could be an example for others to follow, dear Lord, and that they don't just look at us and be like, well, what makes you so different? Why, you know, I'm doing the same exact thing that you're doing, so why should I even listen to you? God, help us not to have that type of a testimony. Lord, help us to clean up our own lives and that, that we would bear fruit so that you wouldn't want to get rid of us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.